What is today's date? 18th of August, 1997, concerning his period spent at San Miguel Metal Workers in Philadelphia. Well, thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I really do appreciate you taking the time to give this interview. You're welcome. Um, one of the first questions I had um, deals with your beginning there. Basically, you were 15 when you started at Yellens. Had you tried a mental blacksmithing before you'd gotten there? No. But I had worked with my hands ever since I can remember building things of wood, mostly. Uh, I learned to lay bricks. I learned to lay stone. Uh, I was very uh, useful with my hands. So you had a feel for the hand-eye craftsmanship yes. in other materials before iron. I did not realize that at the time, but I, I guess uh, I had it. How did you actually come about the decision to, to move into iron? My father was editor of the Journal of the American Institute of Architects. He knew of Yellen, he knew the architects who had uh, designed Yellen's building originally. He knew the architects, I believe it was York and Sawyer, who had designed the Federal Reserve Bank. So he knew what was going on. And he got me the opportunity to uh, work for Yellen for seven dollars a week. Seven dollars a week. <laughs> so really the first that you had heard about Yellen before you went there was through your father's architectural connection. Correct. When you were there, when you first got there, were there the same sort of circumstances? Yeah, there, were, there were half a dozen young men. The only one I remember was Howard Kaiser, who later went on and established his own business. What were your initial feelings upon getting to, to Philadelphia? And where were you coming from when you... I'm coming from New Jersey. From New Jersey? Yeah. So getting to Philadelphia and getting to the, to the Yellen's shop, what were your initial feelings and impressions on, on, on seeing all of that? I was overwhelmed by the size and the scope of the work. And of course, uh, as I realized later, uh, the magic of fire and iron and noise and smoke was so intriguing and fascinating. There were two buildings when you went there? There were two buildings. The original building had been in existence for quite some time. The new building was built solely on the strength of the Federal Reserve Bank job. It was across the street. It was a, a modern building, a very plain, no architectural features to it at all. It was two-story, and there were some forces underneath. The whole top floor was assembly, and but across the street that would be across the street from the front of the building. I know it was across the, the street from the side of the building. The side of the building. Did you ever hear that building referred to as the tonnage shop? No. Oh. Were there heavy equipment in that building? Were there power hammers? In that that? Yes, there were power hammers. Uh, there the. Uh, the stock room with the big shear for cutting the metal was in the original building. And I, I was moved around, I worked in the stock room, I worked in the two room, I worked for various uh, blacksmiths, uh, striker, helper, holding things. The stock room brings to mind a question. When I worked at Yellen's, I saw a piece of stock that was approximately one inch by two inches that had two rosettes with heavy rivets. And under one had been chiseled the word Lancashire, and under the other one had been chiseled the word Swedish. And the iron in each of those had worked a little differently. I heard that Yellen would test iron before he bought that. Did you ever see that kind of thing going on? Oh, yes, I remember. Uh, you're familiar with the big grills on the outside of the Federal Reserve Bank? Yes, sir. They're about an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half square steel. A shipment came in while I was working in the stock room of that steel, and Yellen immediately took a piece and went to the power hammer. He had uh, splitting dies that fitted right in the power hammer, and he took that and he split one of the holes for the bar to pass through, 
and down on a split that was split about two inches on either side. He sent it all back. Oh, so he had a very hands-on attitude. Oh, absolutely. He, he was one of those remarkable people that knew everything that was going on everywhere in the shop. I remember seeing a stamp from the architectural drawing room upstairs of the main shop. It said, see Mr. Yellen before starting work. Mm -hmm. It was a fairly large stamp that apparently went on a lot of drawings. Yes. Do you recall seeing that on drawings? As it yes, I do. Uh, you may not know, but uh, Yellen made all of his drafts would take basic blacksmithing. So that they understood the so that They plan. understood what could be done. They understood the texture, the the taking square stock and forcing it to round or forcing it to octagon. Uh, they were fairly familiar with the uh, material with which they were working and drawing. So in that manner they wouldn't draw a, a bend or an effect that couldn't be rendered in iron? Uh, pretty much so, yes. Okay. In a, in a more specific sense, can you remember what your very first day at Yellens was like? <laughs> My very first day, as I remember, was being shown how to clean out the forges and get the paper ready and get the fire built on my own time before the workmen arrived. We were told, not asked, to come in half an hour early and do that. And make sure that the fire was Make ready. sure that the fire was ready, make sure that the tools that the smiths needed, make sure that the material was on hand. So when the smith came in and punched the time clock a few minutes before eight, he went to work. He worked eight hours, he worked four hours, we had half an hour for lunch, we worked another four hours, there was no such thing as coffee break. <laughs> I remember when I first started there, they said that there had been a tradition that they still maintained that you arrived in street clothes and changed into work clothes. Do you recall anything like that? Yes, there was a big locker room where you could change your clothes just like professional basketball or baseball players. So you suited up for work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you, you said that you were put to making a rosette for most of the time that you were at Yellens once they got you into the work system there. Uh, not most of the time. My, and my, that first commission came along after oh, maybe three months when I had proved that I was pretty handy with tools. Uh, one of the, uh, the smiths helped me with it. They had a pattern for it and it was cut. It was chisel work, drill work first in the corners where the little screws came out, then chisel work, then file work, then forging work. So you were chiseling the pattern out after the initial yes. chisel layout. Mm -hmm. Did you have a template that you were laying on stock? Yes. Do you remember what the template was made of? I don't. But I've seen some that were some that were a guy with a light sheet rental. Okay. So in the sense of how that motif was first explained, did a, did a smith actually show you the steps? I smith did one while I watched. It was a matter mostly of taking the little chunk of material in, in the four corners and drawing that out to a taper and twisting it. Mm -hmm. And putting a little knob on the end and then doubling it back. And he showed me there that uh, one or two of them. He watched me as I was working and coached me, so uh, I knew how to do it. The volume that's in the, the main part of that rosette, of the four petals, yes. do you recall how you achieved the volume if you were sinking it into lead or uh, in metal form? Th that was in a metal form. It, it was very much like your, uh, uh, pretty much like a piece of pipe, uh, only it's, it fit in a hardy hole and had a depression in it. And it was shaped so the four little scrolls uh, did not interfere. It was shaped just for that particular purpose. It had it been made, do you think, of a piece of pipe or had it been rolled no, out? No, it, it was forced out of a piece of solid. Oh, okay. It was uh, like a bottom rivet set that goes, that fits in the hardy hole. Okay. Only it was, was the correct size to fit that uh, particular pattern. Do you recall how many you had to make? 
400. 400. And as I recall, the first 20 tariffs uh, are rejected and uh, made 20 more. I have one hanging on the wall. From there? From then, yes. Oh. Harvey Mellon gave it to me in uh, 83, I think. Well, that must have brought back some memories. It's one of the little scrolls broken off. So it was a reject, but he saved it and he gave it to me. I had it hanging on the wall, and I'm taking it to Washington when I get the NBA award. <laughs> Both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Which of the, the two buildings did you primarily work in? Uh, primarily was the first building, the, the original. Original? <laughs> Were you down on the main floor? Down on the main floor, yeah. As you had finished the rosette, for example, were you to take it just to its form, or did they have you do any of the, the final cleanup? Uh, and no, I, I just did the forgery. I've been told that they had the shop divided very specifically by departments. The yeah. other men who were fitters, men who did a lot of careful file work, repose, were the people whose job it was to do the cleanup on, on the work and the, the finishing? That, the, yes, there, there, were, there was a finishing crew. And uh, you're quite right, it was divided up into processes, different processes. For instance, there were two Italians who did, did nothing but make animal heads. That's all they did. Whatever job required animal heads. Any job that required an animal head, they did it. Uh, when forge welding was required, there were several smiths who were experts in forge welding. Such as gate frames? And yeah. I've been told that there had been a large forge welding forge that had a, a very large man who was in charge of it and a large team of strikers in a big gate, say like for the Federal Reserve Bank or something was done. They would spend a tremendous amount of time raising the heat on large gate members and bar frames. And it would be their job to go ahead and assemble the main frames. So that's the kind of division of labor you're talking about? Yes. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a crew that pretty much made frames for gates and uh, window grills. And then someone else would make the balusters that went. Someone else would make the scrolls. Another team would make the animal heads. Okay. Uh, then it would go up to upstairs to the finishing department and things would be finished if they had to be riveted together, parts riveted together, if they had to be collared, that was all done upstairs. And so the men upstairs, the fitters would, would be doing the final tweaking and adjusting to get it all into the frame and uh, or would it be pretty much ready to They would be ready to, to go together, yeah. Young did not have some of the things that I have developed. He didn't have a very simple thing on the town gauge. How would they approach it? Uh, they would forge it, and then they, uh, they had an end mill that was slip over the tenon and mill it down to get a nice shoulder on it. So the tenon was forged rough? The tenon was forged rough and a little bit long. And then uh, they had a they had a place with a uh, oh no this was at Shrams at Shrams they had a hole down in the in the ground so they could put them uh, in the vertical drill press okay. uh, at the at Yellens they even used an end mill or put it in a lathe I remember at Yellens they had a pair of champion drill presses on the second floor of the main shop below each one of them was a, about a one and a half inch hole drilled right through yeah. the floor. Yeah. So that would be so they could stick a little bit out of there. And it broke my heart when I went back to Young's in 83. They were making some twisted balusters out of 5 8 square. Mm -hmm. And the process was so on the island esque. They sent the baluster to a machine shop and turned the tent. They brought it back and put it in a twisting machine and turned and twisted it cold. Then they sent it back to the machine shop to put the second tent on. So the yellow would have turned their grave. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> so they were achieving their point-to-point -point accuracy by farming up the machining yeah. in 83. Yeah. And then your 
Terry at Yellen's, they would true up that point to point accuracy in the house with the Henning Mill. Yeah, apparently in 83, no one knew how to forge a tunnel. They're going to break in the continuity of skills. Yeah. yeah. Back to the idea of how often Samuel Young was out and active in the shop. Would you see him out in the shop for very regularly? Every day. At least once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Would he be specifically checking progress on jobs and quality yeah, of affairs? Was exactly. Specifically checking progress. If a smith had problems, he'd work with a smith. He'd pick up a hammer and... He'd pick up the hammer and show him. If the Smith couldn't cut the buck, he'd be transferred to some other job, and someone else would, would take over. And that would be a, a yeah. quick, clean decision, right? Yeah, very, very quick, yeah. yeah. Sam didn't waste any time. The volume of work they put out, I, I can imagine he didn't. <laughs> no. He was, he was on top of everything. Of course, he had a wonderful uh, foreman, Joe Kameski. Okay. Joe Kineski was uh, technically as skilled as, as Yellen, and he had acquired from Yellen over the, the years that he was there, he had acquired the feeling for Yellen's style of work. So he knew what Yellen wanted, and he could pass that on to the Smiths. He, he was, of course, he was there all the time. And so when, when he would look at a job in either direct or criticized, critically changed something, he spoke with, with Yellen's authority. Yes. Yellen relied on him tremendously. But at the same time, Yellen was there every day, at least twice a day. And you were working there, did you get an opportunity to, to talk with him periodically? Or? Oh, once in a while, uh, he came over and uh, showed me uh, a little better way to do something. How did he seem? Was he stern? Very, very friendly. He was. So you ended up feeling encouraged as opposed to... He was very friendly, but underneath there was a mind and a heart of steel. No compromise. And no compromise. Absolutely not. Nothing went out of the shop unless he approved it. I heard that there were times where work had gotten to a point where it was close to completion, but when he would see how something had evolved, he was very upset and would simply scrap it and start over. Did, did it appear to be the case? Just like what we were doing at Myers time. Those, those trial pieces, yes. if they didn't work out, no matter what stage of the, the product, beginning, middle, finishing, if it wasn't right, it was done over again. Regardless of cost or time frame, I simply stopped. And I had the same experience with Schramm in Germany. I remember, if, if you don't mind my image, oh, I'm going uh, August Klingenberg was a smith, I, and I worked with him. He was the better of the two smiths. And I had, had experience, which the apprentices had not. We were working on a finger for a gate, and we got it there, and we put it up, and we thought it was good. And Schramm came down and said, Do glad nicht. That doesn't stay. He took it down and he told us what, where we had failed. He was very explicit. And we thought it was pretty good, but it was not perfection. Mm -hmm. So in both cases of, of Mr. Schramm and Mr. Yellen, it was a case of their personal vision of how the job should be, as well as their level of quality that they expected. Absolutely. It had to be as near perfection as the human being can, can do. But, but that vision aspect, that they had an idea about what they wanted to see, not only how good it had to be, but what they wanted it to actually look like in relationship to other parts, did that seem to also enter the yeah. equation? Yeah. And I, I learned this too, that uh, when I'm making a drawing, uh, usually, my drawings are not very good, but my layout is, is accurate. I will take that piece of sheet and put it against the wall, turn my back and walk away the length of the shop and turn around and look. And that first impression that you get. Okay. And I think that was the feeling that Shram had when he saw the finial. 
I think that's the feeling that Yellen had when he came in and took that first look at something. Okay. In the sense they were looking at it as the, the client would, seeing it for the first time, getting that first impression, whether it was a good one or a bad one. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. I found that very useful. Uh, earlier we were talking about the, the spe specialization in the shop, the way it was divided out. Do you recall anything about the representative department? Um, yes. I saw a little bit of that. That was all done up on the second floor of the new building. And I remarked yesterday that when I went up there, the whole length of the shelf on the, behind the workbench were coffee cans with those little short tools sticking out of them. Okay. Thousands of them. How big would some of these departments be? Oh, I, th I think in the record say department there were probably four or six men. And in other areas where it was more direct forging, those would be larger departments? Yes. Did you get a chance to look into the drawing room often? Uh, no. No, very seldom. You said you started at 8 as far as the shop opened, that you had to be there at 7.30? Yeah. And then they, they closed at 8.30, 4.30. And on Friday at noon, you, you lined up at the pay, paymaster's window, and he gave you an envelope, and you took it all home. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you started at, at $7 an hour? $7 a week. A week? Oh, big difference. <laughs> Seven dollars a week. Seven dollars a week. Yeah. There was a series of pictures of parties that seemed to have been held, and even the, the museum um, in the early nineties when I was there, there was a Christmas knife stamped nineteen twenty nine, and I got the impression from the the, the the Christmas knife, which was largely a cake cutting knife. And the pictures that I saw of people with um, costumes on sometimes and hats and things, that there was sort of a spirit of community within, within the shop. Do you recall anything about that? Yes. The, uh, when the, a job, a certain job was completed, uh, a job of significance, there would be a party in uh, Yellen's uh, old man room with a beautiful big fire screen and fireplace there. There were big party. Uh, they were not costumes, but they were paper hats. Paper hats? And I think that's where, uh, who was the unknown black screen? Peter Ranzetti. Peter Ranzetti, yeah. yes. Peter Ranzetti. I think that's where he probably got the idea. The idea from, yeah. from Yellen's paper yeah. hat party. Mm -hmm. I got in on one of them on a certain phase of a certain big part of the Federal Reserve Bank job was completed. And that was cause for celebration? That was cause for, yeah. It was, it, it, it was a nice relationship. And I know I appreciated it. I appreciate it more now because I understand the significance. But I'm sure that the uh, long time, time craftsmen there, the long time Smiths, really appreciated the fact that you know, would do this for them. It was more than just a job, employer, employee. Yeah, relationship. absolutely, yeah. It was, that relationship doesn't exist anymore. I, I have not seen it anywhere. Did you stay close to the shop as far as when you, where your living quarters were? I was within walking distance. Under the tools a little more specifically, when you were there on the shop floor, would you see Smiths making various tooling that was used in the jobs? Uh, uh, a little bit. He had a tool and die maker who made most of the tools. So the more specific shapes yeah. was a yeah. specific uh, I remember in particular there was a big boss, maybe oh, an inch and a half There was a big boss came up like this, like so, it's kind of rectangular. 
and the tin dye maker made one estimating it had a shank on it here driven into the door you've seen them on the European building yes, sir. He, he made one he guessed at the size that it would take to convert that round to a square and they started in and necked it down and rough, roughed it out and then they had to, uh, it was too big and they had a lot of flash coming out so they had to make another one I remember that specifically would this be a set tool with a striker? Mm -hmm. No, that would be a spring switch, a spring fuller. Uh, for power armor yeah, work? Yeah, for power armor work. Yeah. Two halves. Just like some of the spring fullers I have, or a uh, spring switch, or like the tenon tool. Same principle. Okay. Yeah. And so, in this case, it was simply scrap that first attempt to make another he, one. Well, he, he took the, the master and cut it down. Oh, he, okay. The, he, the, the first one was too big, so after a trial, then he removed enough material so it would completely fill the square die. It was first forged round, right, and then put in the foot die right next to it that would forge it square. Did you see him sinking the master into? Yeah. Was that hot yeah. under the tree? Yeah, and I think that was a blacksmith helper to one of the smiths that was doing that. So I pretty much saw the whole process. Don't ask me how I remember something 70 years ago. <laughs> Is there anything more about that process, about how the, the dye blanks looked, or the, the, taken up to heat, the process of inserting the, the master and working the, under the... Well, what, what they did was take the take the rough material like this and fuller it down and then to, to get the start of the shank and then I don't remember they may have knocked the corners off then it went in this die this switch okay. and it was switched round then it was moved over here into a second switch to switch it square when you sank the master itself into the, to the blanks of yes. the dye, mm -hmm. that was a high temperature operation? Yes. Under the, like, yeah. under the size of the power ring they were using? Oh, the it was probably a, a hundred pound steam hammer. Steam hammer. In those days, steam was piped from a steam plant in Philadelphia, piped right to Yellen's shop. Oh. He didn't have a, a, a boiler. Steam was piped from a central boiler plant somewhere else in the city. So in the same sense that today we it's turn the electric, you turn on the steam on the water. You turn on the steam. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in the second question that there, about the specific Smiths as tool and die maker for doing that, if it was a less complex tool, uh, a city chisel for example, or a fuller that the smith needed in a specific shape or size. Would the smith doing the work then go ahead and make the tool? Yes. Yeah. And he, yeah. But you see, most of the tools were already there when I came. The coffee cans full of the Rapace tools. Uh, every, every, uh, the stock room had a tremendous amount of all kinds of striking tools. And wrenches, uh, they didn't have one on the twisting wrenches. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you pick up the idea for the twisting wrench? I invented that. I think that's the only thing I really invented. And I have revived a lot of things, but I think that is my invention. Do you recall coming upon that idea? No, I don't. I, I made that one of them hanging on the wall I made about 60 years ago. Oh. <laughs> you got any money's worth out of that idea? I sure have. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the idea that in the stock room that there were tools, set tools, top and bottom tools, when I was at Yon's, I ran across some coffee cans that had rings. On each ring was a series of bronze discs that were stamped Samuel Yon metal workers, and one ring would have all number 124 discs, and another one would be stamped all eight. And I got the impression that a smith would be given 
uh, ring with all these discs, and he would be number eight. And if you went to the tool room, he gave a disc, you got a tool back, because some of the top and bottom tools are numbered, like 108 and 359. Was there this kind of a tool room, yeah. check-in, check-out process? Yes, yeah. there, there was, uh, very definitely. And uh, it was one of the few places I've ever seen where tools got put back where they belong. <laughs> No, that, that was a, a checkout, a check-in system for, for the use of the tools. The tools were not at the forge except the specific tools that were needed for the job. Not like buying a tool rack there. We need that. All right, so let me... Recording. So in that sense that... One of the few places you've seen where there was a situation where the tools were checked out and got put back where they belong at the end. Absolutely. Then if it was a, a tool such as an acorn die or something like that, it would be worked into a job when completed, put back, and perhaps years later or months later, it could be put into another job. Right. This is an example. I have a request to duplicate this young girl. Fred Chris Parker, I can't remember his name. So the grapes were a problem. So I first made this, that's out of steel. That's the master. That's the master. Then it was forged into this die, this spring switch. So this was sunk into this yes. when this was in forging temperature. Yeah, you can see how it flared out there at the ends. Right. And I also made a, uh, another spring switch to take down the shank. Oh, so you I, th I thought uh, it would be very difficult if I make a, a ball and then when we draw the shank it will be hard to hold onto the ball. Right. So I made two balls at once. Then to this was a roughed out. This is this is what was done uh, on, on this, it was rough forged. So this is and the cut form. That this is the material where you this want. This is the material. And without that, if I simply put the round stock in, uh, it, it, it wouldn't come out properly. I had the proper amount of material to make these, these round bulbs. And we tried, when we resurrected some of Yarn's tools from the basement, some of those switches that we had, we tried for like some of the elaborate baluster things. We tried putting the raw steel in. We found we had to shape it first. So we had the right amount of material in the right place. And then this is the result. And then you have something to hold on to and you, you hammer it out and then put it in this little switch here to make the stem. All right. And then you cut it off a certain distance here, and you have something to hold on to it here. And then you repeat and then the then you two stems, the last thing you do is cut them in half. Oh, excellent. And this is the way, I guess I learned this from you. Of putting the master into the hot yeah. blank, right. and then making a prep form from there, to put the material where you want it so that the, the die master and the blank work more efficiently as the die. That was the same problem here. There was too much in the original uh, round master, so it had to be reduced. So when it, when it was compressed in the square, it filled this die completely with maybe a little flash up, up at the very end. And once they had to rework this example you drew here, and they had to rework the correct form so that they had the right amount of material for the correct. second yeah, attempt. Correct. Yeah. You mentioned um, bringing tools out of the basement at Yellen's. Was that for the 1983 workshop? Yes. What was it like to see all of those tools? Oh, it was overwhelming to see all those tools. Some of them rusting, and because the, I guess the basement leaked. And we cut them out and cleaned up most of them and kept, uh, I think we better in a, a rack to put a lot of those tools on. Yeah. Were there also examples of metalwork down there? 
No. No, it was just tools. Just tools. With a, with a large amount. Oh, lots of them. Well, this is a perfect example of the process that Yellen went through, and uh, it still works. Works very well. Yeah. Are the tools that are in the photo series in the book, are there any that you recall having seen? Did they bring back a memory to, to flip through them? No. No. Not that I can recall. Well, were there any of the, the style that you oh, remember? Yes, I remember some of the uh, scroll starters and the uh, the tools for making the button end or the knob end on the scrolls, yes. I saw those in use. Were there any that you actually recall having used any of the jobs no. later in, no. after the I just I was probably helping Smiths. You see that they there were about half as many helpers as there were Smiths. So uh, we were always called wherever we were needed to work for maybe two or three Smiths in a day who needed some help now, or you might work with the same Smith for a week on a, on a repetitive job. Oh, okay. So on the one hand, you got to see a wide variety Absolutely, yeah. But on the other hand, you never knew where you would be the next hour someday. No, no. Comparing your time at Yellen to your time at the Shrums, was your time at Yellen more of a, of a work orientated time or was it more of a learning situation? It, it was uh, more work oriented, yeah. It, it was uh, really a production line of work with all the different categories being done by different different groups and then all coming together in this assembly room. Did you actually get to see, did the men who work on these pieces get to see finished product? Or were there times where they did components and the product was out the door before they ever saw it? I never saw the rosettes again until I went to the Federal Reserve Bank in 1983. Oh. <laughs> so I had been in and, and yeah, I go and that was uh, the big difference. At Shrams, there was a master who no longer worked. He was busy with drawings and plants and supervising. There were two smiths. There was a master locksmith. There was two volunteer workers. I was one. And two apprentices. By volunteer worker, what do you mean? Uh, we could not... I, I couldn't, because I was a foreigner, I couldn't sign up with the apprentice system. And if I, even if I could, I would not have wanted to sign up for four years, which I had to do. Uh, so I worked eight hours a day. The apprentices were paired. One worked in the morning and went to school in the afternoon. The other had gone to school in the morning and worked in the afternoon. So there was always plenty of help. Uh -huh. But it gave them a balanced education that we don't give our kids now. Well, the man might have to go to college. See, so in that case, you had both the, the mental aspect of education and the hand training of education. It was a beautiful combination of book learning and hand learning. How long were you at Yellen's? One year. And then how did you connect to go to Shrams after that? Uh, my father knew, uh, was very good friends with an architect in Berlin who designed a lot of uh, public buildings. Kurt Baird was his name. And my father was in, in Germany and visiting Kurt and told him about me and Baron said, oh, there's a wonderful uh, artist blacksmith here in Berlin that has a small shop. So that gave me the opportunity. And how long were you at Strong's? Two years. And that was more of a learning situation. That was, well, you see, there we did what I wanted to do. Which was? We took the drawing, we laid it out as we're doing here on sheet metal. We made the parts, we put them together, we finished them, we painted them, 
we installed it. So you had a feel for the entire process. A complete process. So in that sense, the work at Young's, though interesting and educational in its own way, was more disjointed and harder to apply in a, in a lesson sense. Yes. It was not the training that I wanted. It was extremely useful. I don't, don't no, misunderstand I that. that. And I learned an awful lot. But after a year, when I went to Shams, and they asked me to forge well a piece, I could forge well. Kuchmann, that kind of short slice him. <laughs> Look, man, he got all over the world after a year. And they had a, a formula, I guess, a, by their educated thumb. You've got to learn a year before you can do that. You've got to learn three years before you can do this operation. The discipline before creativity yeah. approach. You've got to be a journeyman before you can do this. You've got to be a master before you can do that. And they were right. So it was two distinctly different experiences that came together to give you your start as a... As a uh, it, I guess you could say it uh, formed my life. So in, in your work since then, where would you say most of the influences come from? Um, the experience at Schramm, where you saw the entire job? Yes, I think most of it came from Schramm, uh, the whole job. But the inspiration to really the inspiration Jans of the especially the Gothic work came from Yellen. So they basically set the hook in Tron and we were really doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but lastly, um, if you can think back on um, going out on your own, the, the idea of the apprenticeship journey and coming to master status that you, you experienced yourself. Now, I understand the young and Trump start, but how that flowed together into your entire career to where you considered yourself a master in your own craft. Your journey phase, what, 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 what does that seem like? Well, I would say when I left Shram and came back to California, got a job with a large building contractor who had his own blacksmith shop. I would say I was a good journeyman. I was not a master. I think the master came after about 40 years. And I tell my students, courage. I have done the best of my work of my life, most of the best work of my life, after age 70. That's the truth. So you get to the point where you're master of your medium, it's fun. You get the results you see in your mind at the end of your hand. Whatever you want to do, you can do. If you don't have the tools, you don't know how to make the tools to do the job. You're, you're not relying on anyone else to help you. Europe. Well, I, I tell my students, look at the violin. There are four strings. There are no frets like a banjo. Think how many years you must practice so you put those fingers exactly on the right note. There are 84 keys on a piano. Look at the world of music. Those are the basic elements. The, the, and the 26 letters in the alphabet. Look at the world of literature. There are all of those 26 words. So, when you become master of the four strings or the 84 notes or the 26 letters, then it's fun. Then you can create uh, unrestricted. And the challenge goes from being the difficulty of overcoming a task to the, to the fun of creating yeah. something that you see in your mind. And the fun of solving the problems. And after a while, you get to the point where you solve so many problems, you can find a solution to any, any other problem. A problem. Sometimes with the help, like Dan Norman yesterday, 
Mm -hmm. Why should Ford fall to peace at the opposite plan? And then the transition was achieved yeah. quickly yeah. and easily. Mm -hmm. So at that point in, in your career, the challenge becomes a point of interest, not an obstacle. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you can think of of that phase of your life, of those shops of Yellen's that, that you'd like to add? No, I, I can only say that uh, the first time I took a piece of hot iron out of the anvil and started to hammer on it, I was hooked. <laughs> I guess in closing, in, in 1992, the shop at 5520 Arch Street, Sandy Young's original building, was closed. Yes. Do you have any feeling on that? Yes. It's a very, very sad feeling. That was a an institution that should have somehow been preserved. But I think it's a sign of of the times. I sometimes think in my efforts to uh, preserve the traditional methods, I'm fighting a losing battle. And I think the Ellen Forge was a great loss. This is why I'm so glad the school worked out. I could have solved everything when my wife got cancer and I wanted to help save her life. I could have sold everything and retired. But this is a living thing. It will go on. I found a successor in Zonington. It may have felt like a losing battle in the 60s when there wasn't the interest. But I think you've won the battle if you look at, at the strength of, of smithing and the number of young men that are coming up and young women that are coming up. Yeah. yeah. When I went to the first Obama convention in 1976, I was shocked at the poor quality of work. But you go to a Obama convention now, there's first class work, really good, well designed, well executed work. And uh, it's, it's a great consolation to see that improvement. It's, it's, it's very rewarding to see a student like Dan Norman or Bob Bergman or Dorothy Stiegler or you name it, uh, successful instructors in their own right. Well, that's the continuity that you have to sought to create. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Whitaker. I appreciate you taking the time. Dr. Whitaker. <laughs> okay. Let's go see what they're up to. <laughs>